When I was seven years old, which was I think second grade at this time, I had this uh, teacher uh, that wanted us to do these biographies every single month. And around that time, I think it was like 1999 or something like that, the computer was becoming like, you know, everywhere in, in the classroom and we needed to learn how to type. So we did these one page biographies on famous people. So one month it had to be a scientist. So I remember I picked Albert Einstein. Another month we had to do it on a writer, so I picked John Steinbeck. And then when the music month came around, some light bulb hit. When I saw this like picture book about Mozart, I said, my God, he was five years old when he wrote his first piece, and I'm already seven years old. I'm a couple years behind. Like, let's get started. I, I want to learn how to write music. And, and that was the start of it all. I wanted to start piano lessons, so I started piano lessons with the idea that I needed to learn how to read the notes to write my own music. And I remember around the time I was eight, I wrote like my first little pieces. So it was from a very early age that I wanted not to just be involved in music, but to actually compose it. And, and the specific kind of music I wanted to write was classical music. Um, so it's kind of a strange journey in that I knew what I wanted to do from the beginning, and it was this very niche thing. Uh, but at that time, I didn't know it was a niche thing. I just, it was just something that I, I instantly fell in love with. And I still continue to do it to this day.
So this piece, Dori, it means my turn in Arabic, and it's kind of a playful, a playful thing to say, really, because you know when you're a kid and you think of you know someone playing a game with, with other kids in the playground or something, they say, "It's my turn! It's my turn to do that! It's my turn!" 
So I thought, okay, what if I do something like that in a chamber music ensemble setting? And I thought it would be perfect for an ensemble like flute, viol, and harp. Uh, for me, it's it's a, I don't know why in my head it's a playful ensemble. You know, these three instruments that don't seemingly belong together, but for some reason they have a lot of repertoire associated with them. Uh, there have been amazing composers that wrote for them. You know, obviously Takamitsu, you have Debussy, you have uh, uh, people like Sam Adler uh, writing a, like a famous uh, harp trio for them. So I thought, you know, why do, how do I make this into a playful thing? Um, so I thought, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have kind of like a sort of a mini concerto going on in this trio. The first movement will be the flute's turn. The second movement will be the viola's turn. And then we'll wrap it up with the harp's turn with each of the other instruments being accompaniment figures to those solo instruments. So I said, okay, that's my idea. Okay, now how do I bring the Arabic elements to it and why would I do that, you know? So in Arabic music, a lot of it is based off of the solo instrument with accompaniment figures in the background. So I thought, okay, that's a good kind of baseline for me to figure out how to tie it all together formally. So in the first movement, we have the flute accompanied by the viol and the harp. So to me, the flute is very similar to a, a neigh sound, which is this kind of uh, a recorder-like instrument that's played a lot in the Middle East. And I thought, okay, how can I get these kind of bre very breathy sounds to play on the flute, and at the same time have a very playful character. So you hear the flute playing these very uh, breathy, ornamentated uh, melodies, mainly melodies, that have all these different microtones in them to kind of give you that Akamat sound. At the same time, the, harp, the accompaniment figures are this harp playing this repeated uh, kind of riff with these percussive sounds on the soundboard that help give off the percussive nature of the Arabic music. And then you also have the viola uh, kind of being an accentuation to the harp. So it's, it really is like a symbiosis between the viola and the harp there. I said, okay, that's great, that's the first one. Then the second movement comes, that's the viola's turn. So to me, the viola, it's very much like this uh, Arabic instrument, the kananja, which is like a two-string fiddle that you kind of play like this. And I thought, okay, what kind of sounds can I, can I get out of that that are kind of the opposite of the first movement? So the viola is playing in a very serious manner with a lot of these very uh, uh, intense uh, sounds that kind of almost scratch also on the viola. And then meanwhile, the harp and the, and the flutes are kind of playing these very accompanimental figures in the background. So that was the, the, the viola's turn. And then lastly, you have the harp, which to me sounds like a canoe, which is this, if you can imagine a harp is like this, a canoe is like this. <laughs> so you have all these strings and you play it like this. And with one hand, you can detune the strings of the canoe. So to me, okay, I said, okay, how am I going to get the harp to kind of evoke those sort of sounds? And then the flute and the viola will be in the background. So to me, I had all these ideas set in motion. I just had to fill in the pitches. <laughs>
the the history of music has centered a lot around European uh, music making, and there has been a lot of other music making going around uh, the world at the same time, but hasn't really been considered in terms of how to incorporate that into European uh, music making. And I think it's important because if you are able to make these connections between like European music, for example, European classical music in this case, and other music around the world, you help to create bonds between cultures and you can show that, okay, we all, we all really are in this together. It's not just this kind of music, this kind of music. That we're not, you know, tribal in that way in reality. We are all in this, in the kind of, you know, nice way, a fluffy sort of way, you know, in terms of how I'm talking about it, but it's true. And to kind of showcase that in my own personal slice of all of that, I felt that I needed to incorporate the music of my heritage and the music of my family in that. It, it felt like I had to do it. It didn't feel like, oh, I just want to do it because I feel like it. It felt like a, like a calling in, in a certain kind of way and a necessity for, for how I express myself in the world. And for me personally, it's very, it's, it's, it's also a weird kind of thing that's happening because I've actually never been to the Middle East. I'm just starting to learn how to speak Arabic. I've been speaking actually for three months. i uh, been practicing a lot actually. So I'm like also getting into the culture from an from a, from a outsider's perspective being a completely 100%, you know, in terms of my blood, Arab blood. And I have the 23 in me to prove it. <laughs> but anyway... I, but I still don't feel like I'm really embedded into the culture because I didn't grow up in it. I wasn't um, born there. I don't speak the language fluently. Um, so for me, doing the, the music route in terms of discovering the music, learning the music, uh, diving into the great Arabic artists, especially from the early 20th century, these are the ways that I can connect to that part of my culture and then do that kind of greater mission of connecting how different parts of the world actually can speak to one another in a positive way. So my is, uh, it means water in Arabic, and it was my first piece actually that used live electronics with chamber music. And what happened was, I think it was in 2013, while I was uh, still at USC, I wasn't thinking of writing a piece actually. I had all these VHS tapes actually from my uh, from my parents, like 20 of these things, and they were deteriorating. So I needed to figure out a way to digitize them. So one summer while I was at USC, I put all these things into the v VHS uh, player and um, started to you know put them on a computer. And since these are like tapes rolling like this, I can't like fast forward them and just burn it like a CD. So what I had to do was actually sit there and watch these things for three hours. So each one of these was about three hours of tape. And, you know, after 10, 20 minutes, you start seeing your uncles and aunts when they're your age. And you start getting interested in what, how they were like in their 20s. So I started watching these and I said, wow, there's like a lot of musical occurrences happening in, in these tapes. There's, uh, there was footage of, of me as a baby swimming. There was footage of these big rainstorms in Georgia, which, you know, as someone in, living in L.A., you, know, you don't really see. So I was kind of fascinated by that. And I would see myself, like, in the window looking at the rain as, like, a four-year-old. And uh, there was also this magical sort of moment where me and both my younger brothers are getting baptized all at the same time. So I was, like, four years old at this time. Uh, my middle brother was three and my youngest brother was like just born. So we all were baptized at the same time. And while this is all happening, you hear the congregation singing this hymn. So I thought, wow, there's like all these different facets that have to do with water. And they all have to do with my past and you know, my family's past from like 20 years before. So I thought, wow, there's a piece in this. So that's how that piece happened. It was like little inspiration from my family. It wasn't... Uh, it was very organic to, to, uh, to put it aptly. And what happened was, okay, well, I'm writing this piece based on my family's history, in a way. literally the, the history of my family. Why don't I use some of the music of my family in telling that story? So that was also the first time that I used uh, the Arabic akamat and the scales and the rhythms and this kind of thing 
in the music to tell the story. And in terms of the, and this kind of all goes back to the live electronics element. To say that I wanted to write a piece with live electronics, it made a lot of sense in this case because I wanted to use the pre-recorded voices from the VHS tapes. I wanted to use like this pool hum noise that kind of sounded like, a, like an overtone. Uh, I wanted to use the rain sound that uh, kind of had a nice texture underneath the strings. And then I also wanted to add like reverb, echo, and delay effects on the strings themselves uh, to make them blend more with this, this kind of the surround sound electronics going on. So for me, it was, a, it was actually a very natural process to include the live electronics. It wasn't something where I thought, okay, I need to just put electronics in this because, you know, I, that's, what, that's what I need to do. No. It was, it was a very like, okay, A leads to B leads to C leads to D, and how can I get my initial idea to, to make sense at the very end? So that's how my kind of fascination with live electronics began. I still do it to this day.